Okay, we're back, we're live. It's Hawaii, the state of clean energy, where we relentlessly cover energy in Hawaii. We are delighted and, and pleased and happy and honored to have the spokesman for Hawaiian Electric today, Peter Rossi. He comes for little pieces, but today we have him for the whole half hour. This is, Jay, we just were discussing this. This, this is the best cable program about energy on on Wednesday afternoons at four o'clock in, in the entire state, perhaps in the world. But, you know, I'm, I'm always glad to be here. So It's great to have you here. Thanks. So there's a lot of news lately. I mean, right. you've been you've been stacking up news on me and I want to sort of cover it all if we can. Sure. And uh, I guess the uh, the first thing to talk about is that uh, you had seven applications in there for utility scale solar, yeah. and you just had news that six of them have been approved. Talk, right. talk to us about it. Actually, we ended up with eight, which we got one that came in later. So, but uh, of that eight, six of them have been approved. Three are on Oahu. Two are on, uh, one is on Maui. Uh, two are on the Big Island, and these are all large for Hawaii, large scale, uh, grid, uh, grid connected, uh, grid scale uh, solar projects, and they all have batteries. And this is huge. They also have the lowest prices we have ever seen here in Hawaii. Uh, a kilowatt hour from oil today costs about 15 cents. Uh, these go for eight or nine cents. So we're you know, we come in there and you know we pass that, that on really to the customer. Important. Yeah, we pass that on to the customer with no markup. We don't take a profit on that. You know, any other business when they buy raw materials, they pass the the increase on to their customers. We do not. We buy the energy. We charge a customer exactly what we get. Uh, we have to pay for it. So uh, that's all all huge. It's going to be particularly, I think, important on the neighbor islands. Um, the two the two on on uh, Hawaii Island and the one on Maui are the largest solar projects. They've had a lot of wind, and that's all been great. But some of that is still pretty expensive. These projects are going to be much cheaper, and they're going to be large relative to their grids. So what's large? Uh, they're, they're in the neighborhood of, uh, let me see to make sure. So um, on Hawaii Island, 120 mega, uh, 30 megawatts, 30 megawatts, two of them. Uh, on Maui, 160 megawatts, so same thing in one, one unit. And here on Oahu, these come together to about 110, 120 megawatts. So, uh, you know, a few years ago, it was a big deal to have a five megawatt solar farm out in, in, in you know, Kunia someplace. Uh, now the uh, you know we're we're getting these thirty to fifty to sixty size. So this is all good. There's one project that people have heard about Ho'ohana. Uh, it, it's got a little bit of a of a hiccup. Um, the uh, part of it is is planned to be on agricultural land, prime agricultural land, and uh, that's raised some controversy. There've been as a, you know, it's a reasonable thing to say. What do we want agriculture? Or do we want clean energy? Well, we want both. But we got to make some decisions sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's it's the responsibility of the developer entirely. The responsibility of the developer to get the permits to get that cleared. If they cannot, and the contract is voided, uh, we don't have. It's got to be that way, otherwise you get hung up. Yeah, we get hung up. So they got to they've got to do it. They're working on various ways to do it. Uh, the landowner obviously wants to have them be there. It's a good good use for the land, which is not, as I understand it, actually been farmed in some time. So that's got to be worked out by the developer. And uh, if the developer cannot, the contract says very clearly, and the PUC noted very clearly, the contract will be void, and we will not have cost our customers or our company anything. You know, people... This, this allows certainty. Yeah. But well, instead of having a who shot John kind of experience, if it doesn't work, don't do it. Well, exactly. And the, it's always wise to remember on all these projects, Hawaiian Electric doesn't pay a penny to these developers until the electricity starts to flow into our system. So if, it's, if any of these projects are held up for whatever reason, there's all kinds of timelines, there are all kinds of stipulations they have to meet, and they have to meet them, and that's their responsibility. Our responsibility is to do the, you know, to receive the energy and so forth. So there is no negative financial impact to the company or to our customers. Um, so we, you know, we hope they get this worked out, but it's not an unreasonable question when you've got, uh, you know, there's, there's, an if, there's a finite amount of land, finite amount of prime land, land uh, the ag land is a finite amount of places where you can put a solar farm. There are going to be some trade-offs in life. At any rate, more importantly, we've got these six projects. Two more are still being reviewed. So that six different developers? Uh, there, no, or there, less than six? Less than six. Uh, the two on, two on Oahu are by Clearway, uh, who took over the NRG. 
uh, and this other company that's doing Cunea. Uh, AES is one provider, and a company called Interjects is another. They're a big so, company, AES. Big, yeah, AES is a big company. Big company. Uh, Clearway is a pretty you know, big company, too. These are all well-established companies with a long track record. Um, you know, part of our due diligence in going into a contract with them is say, are you going to be able to deliver? You know, you, anybody could promise, but are you going to be able to deliver? And we are, we feel, you know, we, we made a good choice. We chose these eight projects out of about 24, 25 applications. So we really could pick the best of the, cream, you know, cream of the crop, lowest prices. All of them have storage, which is just so important, as you know. That means that the electricity, the, it's, can be generated in the middle of the day and can be used four o'clock and five o'clock and six o'clock in the evening. No more solar, but everybody wants to turn everything on at that time of day, the visitor industry uh, and residents. So that's, that's huge. Uh, that means we're going to, you know, even though we, uh, we didn't move ahead on renewables this year because of Hawaii Island, uh, 2018 was kind of flat. We, did, we, we would have been higher, but because of Hawaii Island, we, we were level. That's the way things happen. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll, we're going to make, we'll be able to make our 2030, uh, you will. Uh, our 2020, I'm sorry, our 2020 deadline, 30% by 2020. Uh, we're, we're quite confident we'll be able to make that, probably beat that. <clears throat> Um, and these projects, by you know, the, the PUC was very good in terms of getting these out the door very quickly. We filed them late last year, and here we are in, in, uh, in March, and they're getting back to us on, on most of them. Because there's some tax credits they want to take advantage of, and you have to move quickly. Speaking of tax credits and speaking yeah. of meeting, you know, meeting goals and targets, um, there's a lot of talk about the legislature's failure to adopt the, uh, the tax bill that's been Tax, the energy tax credit bill been yeah. put in now for three years, and without a good reason, they, they, they seem like they're not going to adopt it this year either. Now, that's, that's not utility-scale solar so much as it's right. uh, rooftop solar, but it seems to me that if we wanted to reach a, you know, a cumulative number for a, a target date, yeah. it would be a lot easier if the legislature would incentivize people to take, take solar. No? Well... You know, I think it, more even than solar, incentivizing people to get battery, to get storage, if they can, uh, if they can afford it, giving them a little break, that would that would be helpful. Uh, you know, a tax credit is always a mixed uh, a mixed blessing. Uh, you know, somebody else suffers. I I don't really know the ins and outs of that. I know that we are doing all we can do to um, to help people get solar. We had four thousand new solar systems last year. I uh, just saw an article in the, in the Building Industry Magazine where the, one of the people from the industry is saying, you know, uh, we've still got some hiccups and so forth, but things are moving along pretty well. Solar water heating is doing very well, mm -hmm. which is a no-brainer, no as mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we're doing, we've got about five different programs, which if you want to put solar on your roof, uh, you could take advantage of them. You can even expand an old net metering system which you couldn't do uh, without losing your, your net metering benefits, called Net Metering Plus. We have three or four other programs if you've got a battery, if you don't have a battery, and so forth. And uh, our app, which I know we'd like to talk about, our app, is on the app, you can sign up, you can apply to put solar on your roof, you can follow the process, you can get the whole thing uh, very, very wow, accessible. That really demystifies it, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly helps. I mean, the, at the end of the day, we have to go through certain things, and that there are, uh, it inevitably takes time. But, you know, for a person that says, when am I going to get my solar? This really opens that up a lot. So we're doing all we can uh, within the, you know, within some existing limitations. But, um, and the other thing we would talk about, we're, we're modernizing the grid to accept more rooftop before we solar. Go off the, before yeah. we go off the, um, the apps. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to take a moment and talk about your various apps because one of them okay. you got an award for. Right. Uh, and, and the more apps, the better, in my view. You know, <laughs> technology yeah, right, is right. our right. middle name around apps here. Apps are us. Huh? <laughs> so, absolutely. A -P -P, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. tell us about your Can apps. Can I use that? <laughs> well, we have a Hawaiian Electric app, and it just got an award for outstanding outage communications. Uh, you know, you don't want to have outages, but if you do, you want people to know. Uh, about them. So on this app, why, which you can get at the App Store or Google Play or the App Store, um, first of all, you can 
report an outage directly on there. Secondly, you can look and see if, if an outage that you're aware of has been reported, because it'll be on the map. It'll be reported there. It'll tell you roughly how long it'll take to get restored. And um, you know the map will show you. And if you have location services, you can set it up. So it'll tell you if you're going to an area where there's an outage. Um, so the outage part of the map is very efficient. And you know outages happen, uh, just like plane takeoff delays happen. But the worst thing is to be sitting in the lounge and nobody will tell you why in the world your plane isn't taken off. And this is the same thing, I think. People want to know, do they know about it? Are they going to fix it? How long is it going to take? Uh, and, 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 you know, you want to, if it's 6 o'clock, do I have to go out and get dinner, or can I, will I be able to cook? It's not, you know, it's not a rocket science. So that works very well. I think it's really critical in the sense, you know, we're looking for sustainability, looking for resilience, yeah. looking for ways to deal for the community to deal with storms and the like. Right. And instead of having 500 people call you all at the same exactly. time, and suck up uh, all your staff answering calls, and, right. and uh, nobody knows exactly what's happening. This really rationalizes and clarifies it, not only for them, but for you. You know, I mean, I know in, in the case of uh, other storms, outages, and the like in the past, we've interviewed some of your people, and you know, they, they work round the clock. They all have their positions and posts they right. have to report to and, and, and deal with the, the storm, the outage, whatever it may yeah. be. And if they have to answer phone calls and deal with the vagaries of, you know, yeah. of people who don't know what's going on, um, that wastes their time. Sure. This way, with an app like this, they can get right to business. You know? Yeah. And, you know, people can still call in, just to be clear. But more and more people are very comfortable uh, not calling, going on their phone, going on their tablet, and, and pulling up an app and seeing what's going on. And increasingly, that will be the way things are done. If you drive an electric vehicle and you want to know where the nearest uh, fast charging station is, you can go to our app. If you want to get time of use rates, if you want to uh, start service, if you want to stop service, uh, all these things are now coming online in the app. And pretty soon, you know, as they say, email's gone, telephone calls are gone, apps are it, as you, as you very well know. And so uh, the recognition we got for this uh, outstanding uh, app is, uh, you know, very nice and everybody felt very good about it. The important thing is for our customers. It is, we're doing this because our customers ask us to, expect us to, and we get more satisfaction from people sending a, a, a text or whatever saying, thank you so much for your app, than from this award from some national organization. We, you know, we yeah, really, sure. the, the, the satisfaction is in knowing that our, our customers, who are our neighbors and our friends and our family, can uh, immediately access us and get information, especially in the big in the big disasters when the phones are down. Yeah. Uh, you know, to be able to access on the app yeah. uh, is very important. It, it all goes to a, a culture point, and namely that you know, from the time uh, when the princess uh, threw the switch, back when you know <laughs> okay. we've been our electric company, <laughs> yeah, right. and, um, and and you're in, embedded into the culture and the history of Hawaii, yeah. Um, and it's like nowhere else, you know, and solving all these problems, uh, finding a way to a better grid, you know, and uh, doing solar and batteries and generally making, making energy uh, clean and new and high tech. Um, you're at the center of that, but you can only do it in the context of the way we do things here in this state. Well, that's very true. And that's, that's the miracle. Uh, let's take a short break, Peter, and come back, and I want to hear a lot about your grid modernization. Okay. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. I'm live at five every Wednesday where we have entertaining and educational conversations that are real and relevant, both here in Hawaii and across the globe. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, we took the break to talk about the corporate culture and I wouldn't want to 
I wouldn't want to not talk about it now. Can you speak a moment about the corporate culture in Hawaii well, Electric? Uh, you know, we were talking before about our concern for our customers. Every single person who works for Hawaiian Electric lives in the Hawaiian Electric service territories, uh, uses the same electric system as everybody else. Uh, and, and, you know, we're out here in the middle of the Pacific. We have some disadvantages from that, but there are some great advantages. And, and you know, one of them, this company is 126 or 27 years old now. Uh, we've been around since the king, not the queen. The king threw the switch and opened up Hawaiian Electric. And, um, you know, we are very, very embedded in this community. We have most of our, we have a very significant number of people who went to the University of Hawaii, including myself. Um, I didn't become an engineer, but what did I know? Anyway, we're, we're, you know, it's a very, very local company still yet, even with, you know, a lot of hiring and a lot, of, a lot of coming benefit in. benefit to that. Yeah, right? no, it's what makes Hawaii, Hawaii at the end well, of the day, so. But I, I would say this, and I don't think we should ever forget this, you know, you go up to the mountains and you look down and you see all those lights, and yeah. you, then you think to yourself, if those lights were not lit, what would happen to us? Right. And so you're always there. You're well, always there. Well, we're, we're, it's not that I think of you when I go to the top of the mountain. Thank you. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad to hear that. I think of the company when I go to the top of the mountain. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I would think about God a little bit. But anyway, whatever, you know, Moses might be passing you on the way down. But, yeah, I, I think that's it's worth pausing every so often. We do take electricity so for granted. Uh, except when it's out. And, you know, when, when it is out, you recognize how totally, totally dependent we are on it. Yeah. So, anyway. Talk about the grid. Well, we got another approval from the PUC, and that's for our grid modernization plan. We went in with a, a plan, and as we say, we've got a 20th century grid and a 21st century electric company, and we've got to bring that grid up into the modern era, and we've got to do a lot of work uh, in terms of... of uh, beefing it up and being able to carry more rooftop solar, more of these other kinds of programs like demand response and so forth. So uh, they approved about an $86 million expenditure in this first phase. It's going to add a quarter or something to every bill on uh, every month on Oahu, which um, I don't think people will really notice, but the service is going to get better. We're going to have more renewable energy. Uh, it's something we have to do, but it's something we need to do and we, we want yeah. to do. You can't do this side without doing this side. Exactly. You have to, you know, you have to raise it, all the boats. Right. Uh, it, it, you know, everybody sees a wind farm. Everybody sees a solar array. You don't see the computer system behind it. You don't see the little box that they got put up on, the, on some pole somewhere that makes all this stuff work. And uh, so it's important to remember that when we talk about a clean energy future, we're not just talking about getting off oil, as important as that is. We're not just talking about more renewable energy, but we're talking about the systems that allow us to do that, the systems that allow us to give somebody an incentive to let us manage uh, their electric use a little bit so that we can have a more stable grid. And these take uh, systems and programs and all kinds of stuff that's largely invisible but very important. Yeah, but it's not, and it's not... It's not all within your control. You have to collaborate with all the people who are feeding into you. Absolutely. So there's got to be, uh, you know, I always say energy, real estate is not about land. It's about relationships. Energy, likewise, is not about energy. It's about relationships. Right, right. <laughs> so when you build the grid out, you have to be building relationships. Yeah, and it starts with the fact that the customer sets the demand. You turn on your lights, you expect elec electricity to, to light those instantly. We have to be ready to deliver it for you. Uh, we, don't, we don't generate a bunch of it and have it sitting in, you know, we'll, we, we will have some storage. But in, in essence, electricity is a just-in-time product that, uh, you know, we have to be able to, to respond to the demand of our customers. And uh, that takes some, you know, information back and forth. And the smart grid eventually with smart meters and some other things are going to allow you to have a much clearer idea of how your energy is used, how you can save energy, uh, you know, how, how the, eventually when everybody has different time of use rates, how you can do something in an hour or two later in the evening and get, you know, save money on it. So it's all part of, uh, you know, a relationship's important, but until you have a way to communicate that, information in that data, and that's what the smart grid essentially is about. So when you went to the PUC for yeah. approval of this, your detailed technologies and right. systems that, that would be used, 
But you know, one thing that strikes me, and it's, just, it's so for every technology, and especially information technology, while we sit here, it's moving, it's dynamic all oh, the yeah. time. And so, you know, when do you nail it? When do you say, I'm going to make my choice now for this technology, I'm not going to wait till next week or next month? How do you do that? Well, I think you, we, I know that you do it by phasing things. You say, uh, you know, we, we're not, this approval on the grid modernization thing, we know what the whole grid modernization thing would consist of. It would consist of a smart reader on every home, except for people that decide they don't want it. It would consist of a certain number of, uh, boxes of stuff that help us talk to, you know, transmit with each other uh, a better system. We've been using cellular phone systems for a lot of our communications. That's not reliable. There are places where you, you can't get cellular. So there are a lot of things, you know, you can sit here now and say, here are all the things you're going to do. But you don't do them all on the first day. You say, okay, the first thing we need to do is this phase one. So let's, what's the best technology for phase one? And then when you're ready, you say, what's the best technology for phase two? And it could be that by the time we get to the last smart meter, that that smart meter is a lot smarter than the smart meter we put out on, on day one or the, the ones that are already out so there. So go back. So, yeah, eventually we'll go back. But as long as they meet the basic standards. But, you know, so it's the same with renewable energy. Theoretically, everybody wants us to go faster. We want to go faster. But we also have to keep in mind that... Uh, we have to modernize the grid, but also that, you know, if we bought all the solar, all the wind turbines we needed today, uh, by tomorrow there'd be something better. And who knows? We don't know what the better is. So it's important to move fast, but it's important to move, not to move so fast that you end up with, you know, with a, a computer that is out of date before you unpack the box. You know, yeah, that's yeah. why everybody's got to make those decisions about computers. We have to make those decisions about a huge array of different kinds of stuff. A, a two years ago, three years ago, if we'd said, you're gonna be able to get six or eight uh, big solar arrays with storage, it would sound crazy, because storage was still too expensive. Now, uh, I think going forward, if you don't have storage, you're gonna have to explain why, you're, why you don't have storage. Uh, and so, you know, who knows what the next thing will be? Who knows what the, next superior kind of storage is it going to be. It so fast you can't even anticipate. You, you can't. So you, you want to move quickly, but you don't want to move so quickly that you end up with, with buyer's regret, you know, with remorse about the fact that I bought a 19, 2019 car when the 2020 car uh, can, you know, story. park itself and, and you know, all, all the other stuff. So that, that's all, that's all part, of, part of that story. You know, you know uh, when you mentioned that uh, there are black boxes that, that, uh, that, mm, that would go uh, on the customer side of the equation, mm -hmm. and some customers may have reservations about that. Uh, this was an issue in Kauai right. uh, for KIUC, and it, it opens the, the issue of how you socialize this sort of thing sure. uh, about the black boxes uh, so that people understand it's for their own benefit. Yeah. There's no detriment whatsoever in having it uh, installed at your house. You know, and, but on Kauai, there was a system where you could opt out, had to pay, because if you're not going to be part of the system, if you want a meter reader to come out to your house every, you know, whatever, if you want to, uh, you know, you're going to have, that's going to cost you some money. But if, where, yeah, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. But you, I think you would be foolish not to do it. But, you know, nobody should be, it will, n nobody envisions a system where, uh, at this stage, where it's imposed on people. And, uh, you know, as it happens and moves forward and you see it, you see the benefits of it, we hope you'll come around. And very frankly, you know, this happened on Kauai uh, six or eight years ago. And uh, at that time, all over the country, there were these kinds of smart meter revolutions and, you know, people were rebelling against it. If you look at the web today, you don't see too much of that. No, I think it's gone away, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, if people have said, okay, you know, they got them at Kauai, nobody, uh, you know, nobody fell off the cliff, uh, so, you know, what's the deal? And uh, there's a lot of, the thing you gotta do is a utility company is you have to get the good information out there. Plenty of bad information still available on the web about that sort of thing, but you gotta get the good information out there, you gotta explain the benefits, you got to show where the health that there's you know the health or whatever people are concerned about is not a consideration. But you also have to allow people not to feel this is being imposed upon them. Yeah.
So it's a great country. We we will do we will do that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you know sometimes you can have such an open mind that your brains fall out. <laughs> again, which I think sort of happened with vaccinations. But with this one, I, was, I think I was going to make the same reference. Yeah. This is just like vaccinations. <laughs> it is. It's very similar. And uh, but you know. Uh, uh, and vaccinations are a little bit different in that if I don't vaccinate my kids, your kids get sick. Uh, with a with a with a smart meter, you know, and I if I'm pay, willing to pay for keeping my old meter, uh, it doesn't have as much of a deleterious no, effect on if, other people. If, but it, it's, if people don't want to, you know, get on the program and help the, the utility and yeah. the community take new um, new technology, they're right. slowing us down. They're slowing they're us down. They're costing us money because people have to make special accommodations for them. Yeah, but I don't think it'll be that. I, I, I'm confident by the, by the time we get there, it's not going to be that big a deal. But I would never say you can't, you have no choice. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think anybody wants that, even if I think you're crazy not to take this opportunity and it doesn't help and so forth. But I don't think... Anybody wants to be in the position of saying, you got to have this meter in your house uh, and you think it's going to spy on you or you think it's going to do whatever. Uh, okay, okay. I think uh, the things that have happened, the things that we got one more topic to, yeah. to talk about, the bus transportation, but the things that have happened in the last couple of years, say post next era, uh, have, have put uh, Hawaiian Electric in a very good light. Uh, they've been positive things. Um, and I think, the, I think the public appreciates that. And I told you before, I think. You know, uh, I understand that the stock price for uh, Hawaiian Electric is over 40 now, which is remarkable. Yeah. I mean, an increase. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, who knows why? You never know. It's a, it's a free market out there. But right. uh, one, I think one of the factors is the way the public sees you and the way the PUC sees you. They're granting your applications. Yeah. And um, the whole thing is that a good, we're at a good time, not good, right? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think the, not just the way the PUC sees us, but the way the PUC is acting. You know, the PUC can make our life miserable uh, uh, and they can make our life less miserable. And analysts look at this and, you know, it's called regulatory lag. Or, and they look at it and say, is the PUC doing a good job, promptly turning around, you know, applications, making good decisions? Or are they waiting for a million years? And are they, you know, are their decisions somewhat, uh, you know, they're, they're upset about something else and they're taking it. They're, so the, the, the people who set the stock prices really determine that the analysts, they look at that and they've seen over the last couple of years, strong leadership of the utility. Uh, they've seen the, the regulatory system stepping up and, you know, coming into the 21st century as well. Uh, you know, there's always hiccups. I wouldn't, I'm not trying to pretend this is a love affair. And they are very strict. They're very careful to uh, make sure the Public Utilities Commission doesn't, doesn't roll over for us by any means. But on the other hand, they say, let's get, let's get this going. And that's what, uh, and, that, and frankly, the electricity rates have remained relatively stable mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even coming down a bit with, with some of this renewable. So I think all that comes together. Uh, and, you know, we've also, if I may say, we've responded to the storms, to the outages on the Big Island, to problems on Maui, uh, to less devastating things here on Oahu. But, uh, you know, our crews roll in any weather. We get out there. We were able to restore, after I think it was Izel, uh, we were able to restore power much more quickly to the part of the Big Island. Right now, they're dealing with the lava territories on, on uh around uh, the Puna and, and the Kilauea eruption. And, you know, we're participating, we're helping in every way we can to get the people that are still there, uh, get power to them, to get Puna Geothermal back up to contribute renewable energy. And I think the performance of things like that, uh, you know, we even sent people to California to help with the fire. And I think, you know, if you do everything you can, you do it the best way you can, and you do the right things, I think people will ultimately, you know, even though they wish their bill were lower, who doesn't wish their bill were lower? It doesn't matter. But, you know, you say, I'm getting reasonable value, not just in the electricity, but in the performance of the company. So but I think we, we're, you know. We don't live in a vacuum. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, in, in the inner, inner sanctum of this, you know, you have the regulators, you have the legislature, you have utility, you have industry in general, you have the public, right. um, and then in the, in the periphery, you have those 
analysts on Wall Street <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> who could be <laughs> trading stock. Exactly. And they're watching all they're, these elements. Uh, every, you know. Everything. <laughs> they're watching very, very closely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the last item. Okay. Yeah. Last item, the buses and transportation. Uh, right. Can you talk about your success with the, the special bus rates for electric buses? Right. We, we asked the Public Utilities Commission to approve this, and they did within the... Uh, very promptly. We've got a, a, a new rate for fleets, for bus fleets, uh, that basically says if you have a fleet of, like the city has a fleet of buses, many of the tourist companies have a fleet of buses, there are fleets of school buses primarily, and uh, we're, we're now going to be able to offer a rate so that if you charge your electric bus midday when we have a lot of solar or overnight when we are, have a very little demand, you'll, get a, you'll, get a, you'll save about 25% on the cost. So we know that there are two things that prohibit or that inhibit people from adding electric buses to the fleet. The original bus costs a little more, and you'll save money over the long haul, but if you have a cash flow situation, you, you know, you got to look at that very carefully. And the other is charging. And if you have to pay what are here, you know, pretty, you know, strong rates for electricity, uh, that you're going to say, well, you know, it may save me, it'll save me money even at the regular rate. But it won't save me that much money, and there's going to be a lot of aggravation. I'm going to have to put in chargers. I'm going to have to train my drivers. I'm going to have to train my mechanics. And, you know, I don't need those headaches. I, I got enough headaches, you know, with with Anthony Mini business, yeah. getting on the bus and on uh, <laughs> Kali. So, you know, but this allows us to say to these. There are about 20 different uh, fleet managers, uh, city and and. Uh, We've we've had a great working relationship with them. We have an e-bus working group. We got them all together. We said, what can we do to help you? How can you know? What can? Uh, what are your problems? What are your your questions? We've had some buses come in, and and people have been able to try them. JTB just had just initiated the first electric buses for their fleet. We've had a bus test at the airport. So this isn't just city buses. Oh no no, this is all buses. Any bus, any fleet operator that uh, wants to bring in electric buses can take advantage of this. And uh, JTB, which has already started down that road, um, the uh, school bus fleets, we're going to do an experiment later this year, a, tri a demonstration projects with electric school buses. And you think about it, a school bus is busy in the morning, busy in the afternoon, the rest of the day not so much. And the rest of the day is when they can charge that bus. Perfect. Perfect timing, exactly. Yeah. And, and city buses, too. You know, a lot of heavy traffic in the morning, a lot of heavy traffic at rush hour, not so much in the middle of the day, not so much overnight. So uh, tourist buses are going to be a little more of a challenge, very frankly, because they tend to be on the road, you know, other times. But even they tend to go out in the morning, deliver their people to you know, to the Polynesian Cultural Center, come back in the evening and pick them up or whatever. So but, this is charging times. Yeah. It's, the, it's the time of charge, so yeah. to speak. It's the time of use rates for charging, uh -huh. and it also eliminates what we call a demand charge, which is, you know, you have to pay uh, to us on the basis of your highest use. If you're a normal business, it doesn't apply to residences, but if you're a normal business and you, even once or twice a month, you have to use a lot of electricity for an hour, you have to pay based on that, because we have to provide it if, you, if you're going to use it. So that's called a demand charge, and you know it's complicated. But basically, it says in addition to what you owe us just for the kilowatt hours we send you every day, uh, you have to pay us a charge so that we're always ready. We in, our, in return, we're so always the ready. rates have been established. Yeah. These rates are what have these rates have been approved now. They are it's all ready to go. Yeah. When does it start? Well, it started uh, the day the PUC approved it, and we uh, we think based on our discussions with these uh, different uh, uh, bus fleet operators that we'll have about 130 electric buses on this island, on the, all the islands, but mostly on Oahu, I think, uh, within the four or five years of this project. And it's, it's, it's still a trial. Is it a, a substantial savings for that? It's about 25% if you, uh, you know, and anybody that doesn't want the extra money can send it to At the end of me. the day, what you're truly, really trying to do is incentivize the use of electric buses. Exactly, because... Middle of the day, we have a huge amount, and we're going to very shortly, as these other projects we talked about, when they come online, we have a huge amount of solar available in the middle of the day. We're going to have some batteries to take up some of it, which is great, but we still have all, we have 80,000 across the state rooftop solar systems that are feeding power into the system. And uh, so if we can put that into those buses, everybody's going to make out, you know, an electric bus is quieter, there's no diesel fumes, for the operator, it's, it is 
much less a maintenance. A better community. It's really. you know, it, it is. I, I take the bus every single day, so and I, I get off. I get off the bus, and I get a mouthful of diesel fumes. And the bus <laughs> starts up the hill. No more noise. No more diesel fumes. I want the bus on my route first. I've talked to the city again and again. They won't promise me anything. But you know, the point is, if you're living in Waikiki or Makiki, where you know where the sounds rattle off the buildings, it's going to be a lot quieter. That'd be great. Um, I can't wait. So let's assume yeah. this works really swell. Yeah. Um, is is it in the wings to expand this kind of program to regular passenger cars who charge at ideal times during the during the solar day? Yeah, there already is a time of use rate for pa for passenger vehicles. You have to get another meter. It's not the simplest thing in the world. But yeah, absolutely. And if you have solar on your roof, you're in even better shape. If you can have, take the solar from your roof Do it yourself. And, and you put it in your car, which is in your garage because it's home during the middle of the day or, you know, so there's already some of that, but we're going to see a lot more of it. We're going to see more uh, workplace charging. I mean, if anything, most cars sit in some employment garage or some employment parking space for eight, nine hours a day. Uh, during the middle of the day, that magic middle of the day. If you could drive into your parking structure, plug in your car, even a trickle charge, and it charges for six or eight hours, you'd never, you'd never have to worry about it. You'd pay, you'd pay pennies, uh, you know, less than you'd pay for gasoline, and your car would always be charged. So workplace charging, uh, other kinds of fleets, eventually, you know, we think, uh, the, uh, you know, you look around, what are the fleets that are driving around? You have... Um, you, you know, you have taxis, you have uh, delivery, small delivery cars, you have light, you know, you have all those UPX, U, FedEx, UPS stuff, you know, all of those people could eventually have uh, electric f vehicles for those fleets. Yeah, you know what they say, we, we all get, got to get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> get on the electric bus, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Yeah, Thank you, you're going to see them more and more, and they're going to be great. I mean, it's going to be a great, that's going to be a great new world. We're, we're we're just on the front edges of it. Will you come back and tell us more about it? Anytime you want. You know I love to come here because I can say anything I want. And as my boss tells me, hey, nobody's watching anyway. So <laughs> I said, there's somebody out there. There's somebody out there. Thank but you, Peter. It's really a pleasure, Jay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for doing this show. I think it does a lot of good. Thank you. <laughs>